Thank you. Thank you, Joel, for all the Vancouver facts. I came here three weeks ago or two weeks ago for Open Source Summit. I fell in love with the city. And I feel like, well, maybe I should make plans to move here. But <laughs> it's great. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about self-test. Um, kernel self-test, I maintain kernel self-test. And I started four years ago, and I want to touch on what we have accomplished in the last four years, and then also go over um, facts, you know, in terms of framework and briefly. And if I would like to leave some time for uh, questions, if you have any. And okay, let's start. Um, so first of all, what is case help test? It is a kernel um, regression testing tool uh, for mainly started out, if you look at the Git logs and such, you'll see that the very first tests probably were you know, added back in 2005. You'll see it goes that far back. And then it is mainly started as a kernel developer regression test. That means that kernel developers write their own unit tests or functional tests, whatever they think. It is necessary for them to continue to um, find bugs and then also add when they add new features, they go and add new tests. So that we are not um, regressing anything, mainly, and then also uh, making sure that um, as releases come out, uh, uh, when we add new features, we are not regressing, regressing the existing ones. And it is also for kernel users. Um, I often, um, even before I uh, started kernel self-test, we are all used to running some sanity text tests whenever we upgrade. So that's another um, thing for all users, even if they are not in, in any kind of kernel-related things that they do. Even casual users could run them to make sure everything is OK. Um, I consider that to be a quick smoke test, meaning um, it can be used quickly to say, hey, uh, how, how is everything working? It's not, I can't say that it's a complete test, obviously, because uh, sometimes you will still find problems even if, if KSELF test passes. So, you know, but it is a quick um, uh, smoke test. But we are adding tests in such a, um, in a good pace Every release, we add two new target areas. When I say target areas, it's like uh, I'm not talking about individual tests in a MM space or networking space. It's more like new areas, like a C group tests that come in. Um, and then also when uh, um, sync framework moved from staging area, Android staging area, into mainline, main line, Gustavo Padawan added sync uh, tests specifically for that framework to case help tests. So we are doing a lot. Um, developers are very conscious of adding new tests. So what kind of tests do we have? I consider this a mix of white and black box tests. So since developers, kernel developers write these tests, they are, I consider them more white box because they know and understand the code. They are look, writing tests to tailor to that code. And there are some black box tests that uh, users write. They both, as you know, all, all software engineers in this room know, that they both have a value because sometimes um, developers are, uh, have blind spots because we, when we write tests as a developer, we tend to um, write for um, we don't always consider all the things we might miss. So that's where the black box testing comes in. So I consider these as a mix of that, mix of both. Maybe heavier on white box side than black box. Um, they're both unit and functional. Um, they will do unit testing. Um, they go into a particular system call and different flags and test that. And then also functional testing in terms of C groups and um, is an example of functional test. And some are hardware dependent. Um, I'll get into it a little bit more on hardware dependent tests. We do have a large number of hardware dependencies. I, I added a few when I was doing uh, specific tests for a media um, hardware that I was uh, 
working on. And then there we also have stress and performance tests. RCU um, is um, uh, somewhat of a stress test. We don't run them in default. And then also there are some performance tests in, in, the, in the mix. Performance tests could use improvement in, the, in terms of we also have the performance tool that we run. So that's kind of uh, does a better job of uh, in the kernel uh, tools, uh, sources. So people use that um, more. So rationale for adding tests. So I'll go a little bit on what's the, how developers choose to add tests when they are writing. It's feature focused. That means like I, um, as an example I mentioned, when um, uh, MM, both sync framework and MM, as um, developers or kernel developers are adding new features, they go and say, hey, we want to test this specifically. And then, um, so that is feature focused definitely. And then also bug fix focused. So in my case, um, I recently added a, um, a test for a driver that I found several, um, I did several security fixes and I said, okay, I don't want to, um, to I want to make sure those bugs don't crop up again. Um, and then there is that kind of bug fix focused. And then there have been some tests, I think recently, we added x86 space for um, Spectre and, um, and the problems we recently fixed in the kernel. And they're almost always subsystem specific. That's how they are structured. I'll, I'll show you a graphic on how um, the hierarchy works. And what it's not for. Um, it's not for specific, uh, testing specific workloads. Maybe, maybe C group might be a little bit of an exception, but if you configure it right, potentially, but in general, they are not for uh, testing, say, hey, how, um, you know, how this uh, IO um, heavy bandwidth is running or a CPU heavy ba uh, workload runs. And also it's not for testing specific applications. Like for example, if you are going and trying to do um, audio um, application type testing or media space application testing, you wanna, you, this is not for that. We don't have as many, um, and it's, 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 um, it's not some, it's a place either for that. So this is what I wanted to, I alluded to earlier. Um, we have several targets. I think we have about like 46 or so right now. Uh, main targets, if you go into uh, kernel uh, git, and then you will see, I call that a main target, right, right at the different, and then you'll see MM directory, net directory, um, uh, x86 directory, and breakpoints. And those are all the main targets. Under that, we have several subdirectories in some cases. So subdirectories will focus on, for example, Android. Android has um, uh, a ion specific, or a ion driver specific tests. And then they will have, if we, as we add more tests in that space, we'll add more sub tests, sub targets. And then under each sub test, we have test, individual tests. And in some cases, timers is a good example. I don't know if John is here. He has several tests, he, the way he did it, he has several timers, under timers he has test cases, individual test cases. So that's kind of, so when you look at uh, targets and say, hey, only 46 tests, that's not quite true. We're running a lot of individual tests. So who are the authors? Uh, mainly kernel developers, like I mentioned, and then also users. They come in and add tests and I have had um, Kernel CI and uh, Linaro, and they have been adding tests and changing framework, I mean improving, improving for framework. Um, and when Kernel CI and ARM, it, case of test started being used in ARM um, area, uh, it has gone through tremendous uh, improvements because none of the tests ran, even built on, on some ARM boards in most cases. So, in, in the last four years, um, that has, there has been a lot of activity in trying to get these tests to build and run on various ARM um, um, boards. 
So users, we, I mean, a lot of uh, kernel developers, uh, we run them. We don't, we might not run them, run all of the tests. I mean, I run them. But <clears throat> if you take a x86 uh, de uh, kernel developer or maintainer, they might just run x86 tests. All their focus will be. And, um, and then if, another example would be ftrace. Um, they might go, ma maintainers of ftrace, they will run their tests. So, but kernel developers kind of run a slice of tests. So how do patches flow? I um, take patches directly, um, and then uh, in, uh, it, it, is a, it is somewhat complex. It's because it's of the cross section. Of, it, it spans the entire kernel. Um, so when networking uh, tests come in, they will have dependencies on the features that are going in, in the network, net tree. So what happens is we, I have an arrangement. I mean, we kind of, main, we work together. Maintainers, I'll, I'll ask them, well, just take them through your tree, because it's too much coordination if I want to make sure I'm sending all the self-test passes. So that's how we work. So you will, that's why you'll see a lot of uh, self-test patches going in, going through um, up to Linux's um, pull requests in networking pull requests and then also MM and x86. And so that's kind of how we work. And then I uh, take um, framework patches and any other patches. There are lots of patches that maintainers don't really have that much dependency on features. So all of those I maintain, I take. So we work well together. It's, we want, I want to make it easy to, uh, for tests to go in as opposed to you know, having roadblocks in getting tests in. So where are we using it? Currently, zero day rings run it, is my understanding. And then definitely um, Linaro test farm. And um, the way Linaro, I think Linaro test farm, Linaro um, de de developers, and they got involved about a year ago, and they provide uh, great reporting. Stable releases come in, Greg sends them out, and then immediately I see reports coming in saying, hey, 51 self-tests passed, one failed, one skipped, you know. So you're great with the reporting. And it's also run, my understanding, kernel CI rings, and that's where we are constantly improving a little bit because we have, um, we have to target certain configurations based on the board, based on um, um, what kind of kernel config options that particular, we want to run and uh, test on, on that particular kernel that's built specifically for that board. So there are, we are continuously improving that area. Ultimately, um, the idea is to be able to uh, install self-tests and run them on, on all of the boards, as many, as many boards as possible. So w which releases are targeted? We, um, the, they get run on mainline, and then as uh, releases, our releases go from, uh, Linux, Linux does his uh, release cycles, RC1 through RC7 or 8, and then they also get run in stable releases. Stable releases, releases is one that they get run um, uh, quite extensively because every week when the releases come in, we um, reports uh, come out with the releases. And also Linux Next. Linux Next is very useful to me. I think Linaro test form does that. Um, when I'm putting patches into Linux Next, if I know about any test failures, meaning tests failing, not test bugs that are found in the kernel, but more like test starts to misbehave or it doesn't build or, you know, I, you know, we have an opportunity to fix them before it gets into the RC1. Um, okay, so, so this, is, um, this is how much, how many tests we added, I mean, the last four years. And um, I started maintaining this. Um, before this, we didn't have a Tome K-self-test. I had the good fortune to name it, K-self-test, and then back in 2014. Since then, 3.3.17 uh, kernel, uh, now we are at 4.19. We have, in the last four years, we have added about 
Um, we went from 16 targets to 45 targets. That's pretty good. Uh, pretty good. Two targets a uh, release rate. So it's it's really good. I'm um, I was doing the research for actual research for this uh, presentation. I thought, wow, that's that's awesome. We are adding continuously adding tests. So that's what I um, I like. I noticed that we we not only are adding, as I mentioned, if you look if you think about the graph I showed you, target and subtest and individual tests, there is a lot of tremendous um, growth in not only depth and breadth too, because we added a lot of targets and we keep adding new test cases and new tests under these targets. X86, MM, and networking, I have to say, are the most prolific. I mean, they just keep adding tests, which is great. Those are the co core areas. Well, I mean, MM and uh, networking are core areas, so I'm happy to have tests come in in that area. And we have done lots of framework improvements. Um, so what, what are the, so we are looking at KSL test framework, the components wise, we have framework common infrastructure. Um, common infrastructure meaning that if you have a new test added, you should be able to just hook it, up, hook it into the infrastructure and just run make from the main make directory. So that's really the, where the common infrastructure falls in. And we have individual tests. And framework supports a lot of uh, common things like, for example, interfaces to report results. Results is where framework, we have been making lots of improvements because we want to make, make sure that reporting is easier to understand and easier to detect run-to-run -run regressions. So, and then also when a particular configuration isn't supported, we want to report that as a skip as opposed to fail. Um, and uh, framework also supports API and if an individual test calls into an API and says, hey, uh, I want this particular, uh, it failed, uh, print a message, it will go ahead and print a common message that looks and feels the same as the rest of the tests. So more uh, common, more, what do you have more in common infrastructure? It, building common infrastructure to build tests and actually running tests and also reporting results. It also supports the script generation. In some cases, when install is done on a target, we want to be able to run the same, uh, 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 same script that gets run when you are running on the host. So there is a lot of common stuff that happens. And installation, insta install tools are under, come under framework and packaging tools. Packaging tools come into play when install tools, obviously, and packaging tools come into play if you are planning to run it on a different target than you're building on one system and taking it to. So what does um, default run? When you are running uh, KSELF test default, what do you do? It runs non-destructive tests because we don't want to, because we want this run to be a default run that, um, and then also there are a lot of tests that need to be run as root. So root gives you the root, being a root gives you best coverage. Um, I always recommend running mainline, taking RC, I mean, the current RC, uh, release on running it on stables for best coverage. So use cases, um, I can, so uh, you can run um, obviously on the same um, release, and then you can also run it on um, latest and then install and run. So the three different use cases that are, you know, we support. Uh, we have lots of self um, stress tests that could change system state, so I recommend not running them. Um, and if you are running them, user beware, they don't run in default anyway. And then we support uh, uh, test anything protocol for being able to simple text-based and parsing. It helps in parsing. External, we, we, we added that mainly for to support external parsers detecting run-to-run -run regressions, and then also result parsing uh, with external parsers. So I'll skip this, actually. So you'll find the sources in the, um, and I maintain, it's a Linux case self-test git you can find. 
and there are documents in the, under the right under the kernel source tree. And I also, once in a while, when I add, when there is something that happens, I add um, blo write blogs on Samsung blog site. So my challenges, I am always trying to balance kernel developer needs and user requirements, user needs. Um, there, there are different needs. Kernel developers want to run their own tests, being able to run them. Uh, users want reporting in terms of they want to be able to pick out changes. And other challenges I face is balance kernel self-test default runtime with coverage. Because as we add tests, the runtime goes up. But I, we do also want to increase the um, coverage. So, so that's kind of what it is. But so next steps, continue to increase coverage. And driver coverage is weak. I'm looking to see if we can add more tests there. And improving the framework. We're constantly improving the framework in, to aid mainly um, to run in kernel CI and Linaro test form runs and you know, various test forms. And we are improving infrastructure as well as we go along. That's my, that's my slide with penguins. So keep, keep the sweaters coming so we can keep, keep it healthy. Thank you so much. So we do have time for a question or two. Does anybody have a question? Anyone? Slow morning? Oh, Bill Mills. You mentioned drivers, but um, aside from drivers, is there <clears throat> is there a particular subsystem that's on your hit list for uh, you would like to see better coverage? <clears throat> um, so we have, if there are any ARM specific tests in terms of ARM 64, or ARM, we have an x86. Um, architecture and PowerPC and x86 are well covered as as an architecture test. I don't think we have very money for ARM, so that would be one area to add 64 and ARM. When we might have a leverage, common leverage between, I mean, MM and su such cover both, for example. And then, um, so that would be one area I would say in addition to, um, in addition to drivers that I feel like we could add more. Sp specific that are very un specific to ARM and ARM64 as opposed to like, you know, generic areas that cover. So Shua came all the way from Colorado to speak with us this morning. So please join me in thanking her again for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much. So our next speaker, Jelaine Lovejoy, I mean, uh, that's probably the most intriguing subject for a presentation we've ever had at Connect, right? And, and an open source developer and a lawyer walk into a bar. I mean, you think, it's, is this going to be like a comedy routine? Or is this... I wouldn't count on it. <laughs> OK, well, thank you for joining. It sounds really interesting. Thanks so much uh, for having me. This is, um, this is really, really an honor. Um, so an open source lawyer and a developer walk into a bar. I'm guessing you're all anxiously waiting for a punchline. The truth is, I'm terrible with these kinds of jokes, so I asked for a little help from my friends, which was um, quite forthcoming, as you can see. <laughs> I'll give that a second. This is my favorite one. And um, I think this one <laughs> is the best, because sometimes it feels like that. <laughs> uh, because the very nature of open source brings lawyers and developers together, sort of whether we like it or not. And I think there's a few reasons for that. First of all, open source software puts the license in front of developers in a way that I think is kind of unique, if you think about it as compared to working on proprietary code. The license is right there. You sort of can't help but read it. And you kind of have to engage with it. And the other reason on sort of the other side is as a lawyer, you really have to understand some of the technical aspects um, in order to kind of give good legal advice. So you've, you've got to engage with your developers, understand what's going on, especially when it comes to things like license compliance. 
But the most important reason, I think, is that open source licenses are what enables collaboration. Uh, I don't think that Linux would be where it is today if it wasn't for the GPL. I don't know how many people agree with that statement. Okay, not as many as I thought, but maybe you're still asleep. <laughs> um, uh, you know, open source licenses are built on copyright law. That's what gives back the rights to copy, distribute, modify, and redistribute. And so that's really you know, a cornerstone kind of underpinning all that great collaboration um, that happens. But nevertheless, sometimes it feels a little bit like this picture. And so I thought I'd talk about some things I've learned along the way, sometimes lessons learned the hard way on how we can all do our jobs better. Now, every lawyer's talk is supposed to have a disclaimer. Actually, that's not true. That's totally ridiculous. But um, a little bit of a warning. <laughs> I might say some things in the next, whatever, 25 minutes that um, might sound familiar, maybe a little holding mirror up. You may have done them. That's OK. Like I said, these are lessons learned. So the idea is just to have like an open and honest thought and conversation about um, how, we can, you know, how we can do better. So I'll get started. I'll start by picking on lawyers. <laughs> so lawyers need to learn and listen. Um, a lot of lawyers come into this space without any real background in open source. It's not like they train you on that in law school last I checked. And so you really need to take the time to sort of trust and ask a lot of questions of your developers because they're using open source software because of efficiency and all this great code that's available. And you really need to, to kind of engage with that and learn about that. And you know, it, it will take you sometimes in some really murky areas of, um, of copyright and even patent and trademark law. Um, and developers need to have respect. <laughs> I know it's really easy to pick on lawyers. I know there's a whole body of jokes. I've heard all of them. When I went to law school, I was like, OK, it's time to get some thick skin. <laughs> Um, and there's some good reason for some of those jokes, but I have seen some pretty egregious comments about lawyers in public forums by even some pretty influential people that I thought, wow, I wonder what it would be like if those tables got turned. It probably wouldn't go over very well. And in this day and age where more and more projects are um, implementing code of conduct, I think we can all kind of like take that advice and expand it to not just the people you're working with uh, in, on the code itself. Lawyers, um, don't send a developer to do a lawyer's job. This is actually a title of a talk that Simon Phipps gave at FOSDEM a few years ago with a really great story. I just went back and watched it the other night about uh, a poor <laughs> developer in the Amazon, I mean, an Amazon, an Apache project where clearly um, some lawyer was sort of asking the developer to make, um, ask for certain changes to the Apache CLA. You can imagine how well that went over. And you know, there's a whole bigger, longer story about how you engage with the community, obviously, or not. But I always try to remind myself this, because I think it's um, sometimes hard to sort of decide when I, you, know, you should sort of engage as a lawyer and when you should step back. And it's a really important distinction. And I think if, you know, when you start to get into sort of heavier legal stuff, just giving a developer sort of a message, a message to send is not fair to the developer and, and, uh, and, and usually doesn't yield good results either because things get lost in translation. So, so lawyers need to you know, jump in when, when it's the right time and, and, and don't just sort of hang in the background all the time. Uh, so developers, <laughs> legal answers are just not satisfying to engineers. I can't tell you how many times I've just seen the look on people's faces or even heard the dead silence on the phone of just like like the wheels are turning and you're looking for that really you know awesome answer because you guys are problem solvers and it's just not there in the form that you want it to be and it's sort of like this but but why but why <laughs> um, and yeah, if, especially if you're from a you know as a lawyer from a common law uh, jurisdiction you hear a lot of terms like it's a case-by-case -case scenario. It's a fact-based analysis. It's the totality of the circumstances. I like to throw that one around in regular life. And um, it, it's, in other words, it's not black and white. And I know this is really, really annoying to engineers, but um, I don't have like great advice other than you just have to accept that. 
when your lawyers give you a fuzzy answer or we say it depends, it doesn't mean that we don't know what we're talking about. That is actually the way it works. And you know, if you really think about how the law works, that's not always a bad thing. But, um, and especially in open source, we don't have a lot of case law and a lot of um, precedent. So it is, um, it is pretty gray sometimes. That being said, uh, one, of, one of my developers made a really good point to me when I was preparing this, and he said, and, and he was someone I'd worked with a lot, and he said, you know, you, you, sometimes we're just afraid because it's all kind of scary, and if you're just patient, you realize that the, the sort of the answers or the place you need to get to is usually kind of common sense, and I think there's some truth to that. I mean, there's some parts that just don't make sense at all, and there's nothing we can do, but, you know, usually you can sort of come to a pragmatic um, outcome. All right, lawyers <laughs> know what a source tree looks like. <laughs> um, know where the licenses are, know what notices look like. This, this helps tremendously. And, and learn about GitHub. I mean, I think GitHub is the, you know, the most commonly used platform today. It's got a really easy web UI. Even I can use it, that says a lot. And it really is gonna help to know what your developers are dealing with and, and, and sort of what that looks like. And if you do, are brave enough to just try to do a pull request even then you don't know what you're doing, you may actually get professions of love <laughs> and admiration because as I always like to say when it comes to lawyers in this space, low expectations are easy to exceed. <laughs> um, okay, developers. So this is sort of goes hand in hand with the, with the other comment I made about um, the law not being black and white. So, um, and I, I didn't know how to best, you know, there's a lot of ways I could say this, but legal advice tends to be kind of specific, so it goes back to that, you know, sort of fact by fact, or case by case, fact based scenario, and, and it's really hard, because I, sometimes I know I'll say something, and then, you know, maybe four months from now, I'll hear someone be like, well, Jelaine said, you know, blah, 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 and I'm kind of going, well, that was a little bit of a different scenario, and so, um, you know, there's general knowledge and, and that you can learn, and I'm a big proponent of training, as many of you will know, uh, and I think it's, I think actually all software developers should have some, like, basic understanding of IP law. It makes all of us easier to communicate, but a lot of times legal advice is gonna be specific to the scenario, and, and it, it may also be specific to you or your situation or your company, which means that, you know, you don't necessarily go run out and tell everybody else. <laughs> this is what my lawyer told me. So, and if you're not sure where that line is, then you know you can always ask. Uh, uh, lawyers <laughs> don't always be the naysayer. So, legal education is really good. At least, at least my experience of it as a U.S. lawyer um, at, at teaching you how to figure, think through every worst possible case scenario to like you know the worst outcome ever, and. Um, this is actually a really useful skill in, I think, uh, in business as well as just, uh, as, as well as looking for legal risk because, you know, we're really good at like poking holes and like, well, why do you want to do that? Are you sure you want to do it that way? Is that the best way to do it? Um, this is not always a skill that's welcome at home, FYI. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but it is, it is, it is useful, but, but we need to just remember that um, engineers don't want to hear no for an answer, and it's a really interesting thing. I always remember when I was early in my career as a, as a lawyer at a pretty prestigious large technology company was talking about lawyers coming into in-house from law firms and you know, kind of a different approach when you're in a law firm, and he said that they have a really hard time saying yes. They kind of just want to say no because you know, if someone's hiring you to look at all the legal risks, you're gonna you know, be doing all that sort of poking holes and so forth. And, uh, and it, was, it stuck in my head because I think sometimes, you know, no is the answer, but it's better to just take the approach of, you know, okay, how do we figure out how to do this? How do we get to the right place and minimize the risk and, and find a path, you know, to yes, where obviously where that's appropriate. Um, developers. Does everybody know what these letters stand for? Let me fill you in. I am not a lawyer. How many people have maybe written these at some time? <laughs> I find they are always followed by this word. And then the dot, dot, dot is usually a collection of 
maybe some accurate legal information mixed in with total misconstrued ideas and, uh, you know, I don't know, your uncle. <laughs> Just kind of a mess. So. Um, this would just be good. <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say about that. So if there's a theme from all of this, or at least the theme that I came up with, is I think we need to just all think about when to lead, when to follow, or when to just get out of the way. And you know, that goes for sort of both sides, if you will. Um, sometimes, as lawyers, we need to take a stronger lead. and. And we've seen some actually examples of that with Jeff talking about the GPL cooperation commitment as being a, a great example. Sometimes we just need to follow and, and sometimes you just need to get out of the way. And it goes the same for, for developers. And I think the other thing that's sort of more of a subtext is there's always a bigger context. And sometimes you don't know what it is and sometimes you need to be informed and sometimes you just aren't gonna know but it's there, and, and just sort of being aware of that, I think, always helps that, you know, there may be other things going on, whether it's on the development side and deadlines and goals that have to be met, or on the legal side, there may be other things brewing that, you know, aren't necessarily ready or to be talked about, but, but there is always a bigger context. So there was a bunch of other things I wanted to put on these slides that didn't fit nicely into this, like, lawyer and developer category. So, I've got sort of this sort of general stuff for organizations. I figure organizations are where we come together. And, uh, and, and you know, like I said, this didn't fit into much of a category, so it's a bit of a mishmash, but um, stop the CLA madness. Does everyone know? <laughs> um, does everybody know what CLA stands for? Contributor License Agreement. Um, and, and I should note that I'm, I'm highly generalizing. Contributor license agreements are essentially just a different license for the inbound license or the, un, for the license for the contributions coming into the project as opposed to the license that's used for going out. Um, they, they can vary quite a bit. And so like I said, I'm generalizing, but it's important to know that they can vary because that actually burns a lot of lawyers' time. And um, th this is like a whole talk in and of itself. I actually spent uh, quite a bit of time chatting about this recently with some other lawyers. And, uh, but what's been interesting to me is there was a period, um, I think there's sort of a pendulum swing if you go back, way back to the history of open source on the use of CLAs. And, and some years ago, I probably have a talk from like six years ago, like, yeah, people are starting to not use CLAs and go to inbound, outbound, and you know, isn't this great? And then just recently, there's, I've seen more, and I found this quite concerning, and I think, um, uh, there's a number of potential theories of why that is, but one reason I, I think I see is that there's more um, automation to make it sort of easier to sign a CLA, so I don't necessarily think this is a good thing. And, um, and I've seen some engineers, you know, wanting to solve that problem and kind of going, oh, we've got this great solution for signing CLAs, and I was like, did you even talk to a lawyer about what the legal requirements are for that, and why are you doing this anyway? Don't make it easier. Um, so, I mean, you know, the, the bottom line is, at least for me, is, is if you're going to use a CLA, know why you're using it, have a reason, and then implement it in a way that actually realizes that reason, because I think sometimes um, that's not really me doing either, which just, you know, stop and think. And that goes, you know, obviously for lawyers, but I think companies as well. And, uh, and otherwise, just use the inbound outbound model with the developer certificate of origin sign off. And if you can't figure out a good reason why the CLA is better than that, then see, see first point. <laughs> um, so this might be preaching to the choir, but um, open source is free and open. And uh, I feel like I've seen just recently some interesting developments, usually some kind of creative licensing terms added to other open source licenses or what have you um, that aren't open source. Um, I think this is really unhelpful and really dangerous. We have definitions. 
We have the four freedoms from the Free Software Foundation, and we have the open source definition from the OSI. If you haven't read either of those in a while, because we probably all take them for granted, it might be a really good time to kind of remind yourself of what it means. Um, but these have become codified. You know, these have become accepted in, in the world we you know sort of work under, which is a really good thing. I, I, I think it's. I hope, anyway, less likely that we're having the argument of what is open source. So when someone comes up with something that sort of sounds like it's open source or tries to adopt that or uses a name that's kind of familiar but not quite, um, I think us as the community needs to call that out and say, no, you know, you can do that. You can do another licensing model. The, lots of other licensing models are around. There's nothing wrong with that if you want to charge money for something, that's fine. Just don't call it open source. Or you know, if you're gonna restrict certain uh, people or certain, uh, certain things. So I think it's up, up to us to, to make some noise, you know, to call that out and say, yeah, you can do that, but you know, call it something else. Um, <laughs> similarly, uh, we should be engaging with the community. Again, this seems like a no-brainer, but um, I was thinking about this recently because I was gotten together with some um, attorneys in this space, and I was feeling incredibly thankful at the knowledge that I've gained from sort of the people who've been doing this longer than me, and kind of starting to realize that now I've been doing this so long that it's sort of my responsibility to share that knowledge as well. And um, I've just seen a surprising amount of new people coming in that have lots of enthusiasm and great intentions, but maybe just a little bit too much misplaced confidence. And um, you know, if you have a new and great idea, obviously you want to share it, and we don't ever want to squelch that, but you, you might want to like ask, because someone actually might have thought of that before. And anyway, I mean, just barring just saying respect your elders, which would just sort of sound like a totally grumpy old lady, I just <laughs> think there needs to be, you know, we need to help people kind of see that. and and people come in, you know, we want to encourage new blood, but again, um, make sure that people understand that, you know, you also have to learn, earn your dues, which kind of directly relates to that, my, my, previous, <laughs> my previous slide. But uh, I think, again, it's sort of on us to sort of help people understand sort of, uh, you know, that there is already like an open source definition or, you know, what have you. Um, so, I think this has gotten better, but I still think a lot of companies struggle with sort of how to value open source. I mean, I don't think there's a technology company out there today that doesn't completely rely on open source. This should be sort of obvious. And, and then, you know, you've seen companies that aren't even really software or technology companies in the way we normally think of it that do software. And now they have to kind of, and then they're doing software, so, you know, they're doing open source. And, um, but, but I think when, companies and business people try to put it into the neat little boxes of resources or uh, you know, dollar signs or bottom line, it, it gets a bit um, challenging. And, and then as a result of that, um, the people who do open source sometimes are not valued or treated like they're replaceable. And I know, you know, if you're a kernel maintainer, I mean, that's, that's like, you don't find those people lying around, right? <laughs> So um, we need to really make sure that that's valued. I think um, there was a book a few years ago called The New Kingmakers. So if, as, I think it's still relevant today. So I don't think it was from like 2012. So if software developers are the new kingmakers, then open source software is certainly part of that royalty. And I would say then the lawyers that support you are also sort of in the family. <laughs> and uh, and that, should be, that should be valued. Um, whew, I'm going through this way too fast. Uh, so finally, I think we need to facilitate diversity and inclusion. I think this is like a big hot to topic. And the reason that I wanted to bring it up here was I'd never been to Lenaro Connect before and I was looking through the photos of the last one and I was just looking through them for some random reason like looking for photos of certain people I know in fuzzy unicorn outfits. <laughs> But what struck me was how few women were here. I mean, it was like, it, I wasn't trying to think about it, and it struck me, and I thought that's you know, really unfortunate. And then that made me think about all these numbers you see about the lack of women in STEM subjects and lack of women in software. And then that there, it's even worse in open source. I mean, I don't know if you guys saw, not too long ago, GitHub did a survey, I think it was like 5,500 people over 3,800 projects, and 3% of them were women. 
That is horrific. Um, and I'm, diversity is much more than gender, obviously, but, but as a woman myself, it's something I can speak to. I've been to a lot of these conferences. I'm always outnumbered. Um, and uh, it's something we need to work on. And I think there's more conversations about that and there's more programs and you know, that is not something that changes overnight. It's, it's, a, it's sort of a slow change, but um, it's really good to see that. But I'd like to leave you all with a challenge and that your next time you come here, you do something to help someone who wouldn't normally come or might not know about this or might not know how to get here and, and help them make it happen. Because I didn't put encourage and I didn't put support. The only way these things change is if everybody makes it uh, part of their DNA to change it. So. So, an open source developer and lawyer walk into a bar, and my non-funny punchline would be that they grab a drink of their choice, and they have a chat, and say cheers. Thank you very much. Jelaine, thank you so much for coming, coming here.